Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 77 of the podcast. So after an entire summer of taking off and not doing any interviews for several months, I have an interview person. <laughs> so Emily King is a Instagrammer. She shares photos there. She also uh, posts lots of comments to YouTube. And I started noticing her name popping up quite a bit and I got curious. So I went and checked out her Instagram feed and it was full of gorgeous photos. Uh, really, really beautiful photos. A uh, lot of which I recognized because she lives in North Carolina too. So immediately hit it off and said, hey, you wanna come on the show? Uh, because Emily is not just a photographer, she is a quilter and she just got into this only a few months ago. So I hope you're looking forward to this interview with Emily. We talk about a wide range of subjects. We talk about photography, we talk about quilting, we talk about being a wife and mother and balancing our need to be creative and to make things and to have that alone time and that alone space uh, to do those things with also the need to nurture and take care of our family and to be good at uh, being a wife and being a mother too. And I'm always trying to find that balance where uh, I feel like there's enough of me to go around. So I'm really wanting to talk to other people about this. Uh, I feel like finding that perfect balance is a continual search mission. You know, it's a continual balancing act kind of thing. Uh, and I don't think there's a single answer. I don't think there's a single solution, but I think it's a really good thing to talk about more than anything else. So what's going on around the house? I am working on Lucy. I have pulled out my freeform crochet sweater, which is, gotta say, about two lines of crochet from being done. Uh, so I took it out and I actually wore it to an event this weekend. Unfortunately, it was very, very hot outside and I was kind of miserable. And just a brief description, this is a crazy freeform crochet sweater. It has about three quarter length sleeves in its red, orange, yellow, and kind of a, a lighter yellow. Very, very bright. Everyone else was kind of wearing dark blue, very muted colors, and I'm like, sunshine! <laughs> I come out and bring the sun. Uh, so yeah, I always share a little intro and share what I'm working on around the house and then what I've gotten done uh, during the week and any tutorials that you might want to go and check out. And I do this little intro because it helps me stay on track and it helps me kind of make sure that I don't leave a project and kind of shove it in a box and never finish it. Uh, and I know that after wearing it, that this side of the shoulder just starts to slump after a little bit. It just kind of keeps pulling off my shoulder and I keep tugging on it, which is annoying. So I wanna bring that in, tighten up the whole neck area, probably two or three lines of, of crochet here. will tighten this up really nicely. And just so you know, we have video in addition to the audio on the podcast. So if you'd like to see what I'm working on, you can come and check out the video at leahday.com slash episode 77. And this will probably be the last week that we are publishing to leahday.com because I'm going to start publishing these posts to the Free Motion Quilting Project again. Uh, so I took a little while just to kind of play around with posting. So sometimes I was posting to the Free Motion Quilting Project and that is my blog that I've had since 2009. And that's really where I like to post, you know, more of a blog post and kind of my daily updates and the stuff and the podcast really fits there nicely. Well, the problem was that the blog, um, blog that I originally started was a blogger blog and that's blo uh, blogspot.com blog. Well, unfortunately, Blogger is owned by Google, and unfortunately, Google decided to stop supporting Blogger. Not that they're shutting it down, they just keep, they do these little updates about once a year or so, maybe every two years, and they just take things away. And they've slowly taken things away and taken things away until finally I kind of looked at it and gone, why am I still messing with this? You know, why am I still putting up with this? Uh, and, you know, I think it's good in general to check in on, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff. For me, it's businessy, but it's also just good to kind of keep an eye on how things change. Companies will come out and, and be great at what they do in the beginning. You know, they're ambitious, you know, they really want to save the world or whatever. Blogger was a great blogging platform in 2009. 
And then, you know, whether it's competition or, you know, um, the, you know, WordPress kind of dominated the market and they ended up, I think, more or less winning that whole kind of competition over where, you know, to put your blog is best. And, and then everyone else just kind of starts to fall to the wayside. And so I'm not saying that blogger is going to disappear, but I honestly, I just don't feel like it's a safe place for my blog to be. And looking at how many posts I had to transfer over, it was in the 2000 range. So big, big, big work. Uh, fortunately, I found help and it has been going very, very smoothly. So that's been wonderful. So there's only so long you can kick the can down the road before you really got to just bite the bullet and take care of that stuff. And I'm really excited to see where this goes. Of course, having all of this worked on like right this week is probably not the best choice because this week is the launch of Mally the Maker. And this is a pre-order launch. You can come and pick up the book uh, for a nice discount. And I'm gonna sign all of the copies that are sold from mallythemaker.com. That's the website. We decided not to list this on leahday.com just simply because we'd have two sites, two different product pages, two different sets of ordering systems. It was too crazy. So come to mallythemaker.com, pick up your copy of Mally the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt. And it's so funny, there is a world that Mally goes to, not giving up too much here, and it is Quilst. And it's spelled Q-U-I-L-S-T. Now I've gotten a few emails from quilters that saw that word and they're like, there's misspellings <laughs> on your product page. You know, you're meaning to say quilts. And I'm like, no, that's actually the title. And I've capitalized it. That's quilst. And I think next week on the podcast, I'm going to read a little bit from chapter one and chapter two. So that way you can kind of get a little bit of an idea of how Mally goes into Quilst, how that all happens. But yeah, I am super excited about this. And just based off of the, you know, little bit of sales that we've gotten so far, I'm really excited uh, because this book has taken a year to write and edit and uh, lay it out and illustrate it and all that good stuff. And that's a lot of time to invest in a project. But I'm almost at the point, and I always get a little scared uh, before something launches. It's, it's, it is a scary thing. It's putting yourself out there in a way that um, is very vulnerable. And uh, at the same time, you know, even though I've been kind of a little stressed and a little scared the last couple of days, I kind of like, this is still one of the best things I've ever done. And I truly believe that. Uh, and I mentioned the illustrations earlier, and here is one of the, one of my favorite illustrations is the map of Quilst. And that I think is just came out really, really good. I love that. And then some of the illustrations, I put a little illustration at the beginning of every chapter. So yeah, I, I really love how it came out and I'm super, super excited about where that goes. And Miss Bunny is done and she is also in pre-order too. So if you would like to pick up a book and a copy of the Miss Bunny doll pattern, you can get the two of them together. So that was really cool. I did not expect to be able to finish and test and get Miss Bunny as solid as I did in just the last three days, which is, you know, I was just really tickled to death with that. And I ran through, uh, two more tests, so these are, are two new dolls that I made, and this fabric, this brown fabric, I actually printed that with spoon flower. This fabric, that is the pink calico, that's printed with spoon flower too, and this is based off of what I remember my Miss Bunny doll wearing, and when it came in, I was like, that's it, that's Miss Bunny fabric. <laughs> and it, it honestly, like looking at her, it just brings back so many memories. Uh, Miss Bunny is a character in the book, but long before she was a character in the book, she was my doll that I grew up with, you know, that, that very, very special stuffed animal, and I lost her. I lost that doll on a camping trip and bringing her back in Mally the Maker has been such a delight. Number one, I've given her a whole awesome personality and she's one of my favorite characters in the book. And then I also get to make these dolls and basically bring her back to life again and hopefully 
uh, quilters or sewists will make more dolls and give them to little girls and those little girls will grow up and become quilters and sewists too. Because I, I truly believe that holding something like this, it's just a different feel, it's just a different it's just a different thing from a store-bought stuffed animal. I really believe that. And yes, her underwear came out really nice too. I made matching underpants for this one <laughs> in that calico fabric. So yeah, and uh, I am thinking about doing a spoon flower panel, like a cut and sew panel. I don't know, I need to, I definitely have to test and test and test that because I wanna make sure that everything prints right so it doesn't go wonky on you and, and come out weird. So I'm going to play around with that idea. So if you want it to be already printed for you where all you have to do is cut out around the lines, that's a possibility. I'm gonna still be tweaking that, that's gonna be down the road, but I'm definitely gonna be doing tutorials on that in the next few weeks. And speaking of tutorials, another one that came out this week is hand sewing. So this is how I got started with uh, sewing and stitch work. I did hand work. I did hand piecing when I was a little girl. Uh, I, did, I had a sewing machine, but I didn't know how to use it. And so uh, my mom taught me just a basic, you know, hand stitch, just making stitches on fabric. And it was just something to do. And I was one of those kinds of kids where I would set in a corner and just be messing with stuff. <laughs> I can remember just like, I, you know, I just kind of wanted to just sit and do my own thing. I didn't really want people to be messing with me. I'm the youngest. I, you know, I just wanted to be left alone and yeah, sat and stitched. Uh, and so I think this is doable for a young kid. I think this is doable for a 10 year old. Uh, I actually helped out two years ago I think it was two years ago, my son had a pioneer day at school and this is what they made. They made four patch blocks, they turned them into pillows and I helped out the day they were supposed to uh, stitch down the center and then stitch around their pillow to make their, the outside edge to make the pillow. So I brought a sewing machine to help reinforce and uh, the stitches were oftentimes, you know, bigger than the width of my thumb, but it was still good. It was still teaching kids the basics of stitch work, the basics of sewing. And you know, some of, some of the kids had great stitches and, and they were you know, quite you know, good looking and even, which is really the thing that's the struggle. It's not necessarily so much the big chunky stitches as consistency, getting all of the stitches to come out the same size on the front and back. So I hope that you'll come and check this out. This is gonna be at mallythemaker.com slash four patch is where you'll be able to find it. It is completely hand sewing, so you do not need a sewing machine. All you need, actually everything that I, I made from that tutorial is right here in the sewing box. I used like one pen, one needle, pair of scissors, a ruler, a marking pencil, and my thimble. And that's it. And that's why it's, it's so nice to have handwork projects that you can just carry around with you. And I keep mine in my My Little Pony lunchbox. But another thing from the book that I'm gonna be looking for is Mally's Sewing Box, which is also basically a metal lunchbox, but it's bright red. So I'm gonna be looking for that. That will be a lot of fun. I, you know, I wrote the book with my preferences, of course, in mind and the things that I do and like the little nuances and, and things that I love. And, you know, one of the things is like a pair of scissors that Mally wears, they get stolen by the bad guy. <laughs> I had so much fun incorporating these little elements into the book that then now it's just gonna be so much fun to share those things with you guys uh, and see where that goes. So yeah. That's really exciting and that is, yeah, that's pretty much it. Ooh. Oh, this is fun. So uh, I told you about the Cleveland County Arts Council. They had that, you know, kind of a, it was a charity thing. Uh, and my other two paintings I finally finished. Here's a picture of them and they took forever to, to paint because I was using very special paints and dripping it down the sides and it was just, it ended up being a lot more work than I expected. This took 30 minutes. What it is, it is a canvas covered in light brown leather. I'm actually going to paint the leather so it's gonna go darker. On the surface of this leather covered canvas is 
studs and more leather that are holding on a pair of tweezers, a pair of scissors, and a pair of nail clippers. And the idea was that, you know, like a steampunk uh, accessory tray. You could put it on your wall, you could put it in a drawer, and it would have all of your like kind of nail scissors and that kind of thing and tweezers, all of those accessories in one place so they never get lost. And there also has a little pocket on the front where you could put like floss or, uh, you know, we use a polysporin, you put something like that in the pocket. So I had so much fun doing this and this was so much faster. This was 30 minutes pounding some rivets. Seriously, lots of fun, very, very fast. I'm gonna be making more of these and I'm gonna make one sewing or quilting themed. Yes, I, you know, I definitely wanna do something along those lines uh, where it's, you know, like my bobbins for my treadle sewing machine could be strapped on, uh, like nice pair of scissors, something like that. And the leather is like, it's got that nice steampunky look and I use brass, um, those like kind of dark antique brass rivets. I just love it. So that was a really quick finish. Definitely reminded me that we don't have to make things as hard as we sometimes make them. Um, this I had so much more fun with and it was so much faster than those paintings. And while the paintings turned out pretty, uh, they just ended up, they, they took like a month and a half and, and just bogged down and got really, really, really slow. And I realized more than anything else, what I need, what I have to have in my projects is speed. You know, uh, if I, on, on something small like this. Now, if I'm anticipating that it's gonna take months, then I'm perfectly fine with that. You know, I will steadily plot away on something if I have a plan for plotting away at it. Uh, so just for an example of that, I have already started Mally the Maker book two. I have gone back to my writing habit. Uh, I drop James off at the bus stop in the morning and I get a good hour and a half to two hours of writing time in every single morning. And that's even on the weekends. I will wake up a few hours earlier than the guys and get my writing time in in the morning early so that way it's knocked out. I reach my word count or I aim to reach my word count uh, and I'm already making progress on that book. So sometimes a project needs to plot and it's gonna take a little bit more time. Sometimes you expect a project to go fast and then it doesn't and that's hard. And I think that's where those paintings really struggled. And it's, it feels really good to have those done, that table cleaned off. And now I have so many more ideas, of course, of other things I wanna play with. So yeah, it has been definitely an adventure week. Oh, I forgot about this. Um, I have a tutorial for you guys on the long arm. So this is a farm charity quilt and just picked up a kit at my local quilt guild. Uh, they go on ahead and pre-cut the kits for us at the Charlotte Quilt Guild so that way it's really easy to make the charity quilts. Uh, so grab this. Dad helped me piece it. I pieced some of the strips and dad pieced some of the strips. We knocked it out in like an hour. And then it sat there unquilted for a good month or two. And I said, okay, I got my other quilt finished. I wanna finish this in a day. Actually, I wanted to finish it in an hour and I finished it in 45 minutes. I'm so happy with it. Uh, so the name of the design is Wobbles and Bobbles, just kind of a silly design that I came up with. Uh, it works and I think it came out nice. I got one kind of <laughs> slightly nasty comment on YouTube about it like, I've seen nice designs and that's not nice. And I was kind of like, huh, well, <laughs> that's your opinion. <laughs> that's okay. I mean, it was an experiment, it really was. So I hope that you'll come and check out the tutorial. Uh, I believe that's leahday.com slash one hour quilt uh, because the quilting on it, seriously, it took less than an hour, uh, super fast. And I think the texture's quite nice. It ended up having a texture that's mostly a wiggly grid like matrix, but every once in a while you get these bobbles coming together and had all sorts of different descriptions from people like lava lamps, uh, you know, um, the furrows that you get when you plow a field, you know, all different kinds of things. So I think it turned out really cute. And I plan to continue, you know, just stitching out whatever I'm needing to stitch out for my projects and experimenting. And I've got a new tutorial for you at the end of the week. Uh, it's Frame Quilting Friday that I do those long arm tutorials. 
And my goal is just to continue to learn and push myself. Uh, and I'm always trying new things. So I hope that you'll join me for that tutorial and check it out. It's gonna be another little baby quilt uh, that I'm stitching out this week. So I had a few questions that I'll come go through real quick and then we'll get to the interview. So uh, Cynthia said one comment regarding polyester batting. She said, I see so many purists that turn their noses up at poly batting. I was using it for ages, almost exclusively because of the cost effectiveness of it. I saw no difference in how the quilts turned out or how I was able to quilt the quilt by hand or machine, as long as it was low loft. I love that you're not a batting snob, adorable quilt, Leah. And that was about this quilt. This has a uh, uh, Hobbs Tuscany wool in it. And I commented as I was, as I was quilting it, because I really haven't used that particular batting that much. It's so fluffy. It has such good loft. And I really enjoyed using it. So, and I think Hobbs or Quilter's Dream, you pretty much can't go wrong with either of those two brands. The only time that you can really go wrong with a polyester batting is if it's really, really cheap. So just watch out for that. But yeah, there is no need to get snobby about polyester. It's good stuff. Uh, you know, depending on the loft, it can be really lightweight. It can be really warm. Uh, it is excellent and cost effective. And I think it's a good batting. And it, sorry, if it was that bad, do you think this many companies would be making it? I mean, it's a very popular batting. So I think it's good. I think it's great. Okay, Lori, uh, this was a comment about last week's podcast, which is about uh, long arm or home sewing machine and this whole term mid arm, which is, I still find very, very, very confusing for everybody. So Lori said, maybe we should just call them quilting machines and sewing machines. That's pretty clear, right? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> you can quilt on your sewing machine, which kind of causes problems. I mean, I completely agree. It would be really nice if we could just stick with home sewing machine and long arm. And let's just stop using the term mid arm. I had a few people that were like, oh no, this other thing means mid arm, like a long arm put on a table. Well, I call that a sit down long arm uh, because it's still a long arm because it doesn't have feed dogs. You can't piece with it. Even when it's set up in a table, it still fundamentally is a long arm. So. If you're feeling a little confused, please go check out podcast number 76. I, I go into a lot of detail on that podcast to explain. And I have one more comment from T. She said, I have two reasons for buying a long arm. One, I hate basting with a hot passion. I didn't have a large enough area. It killed my fingers and back. Two, I make mostly larger quilts and it took forever to get them quilted on my domestic machine. Plus the weight of moving a 70 by 90 or bigger quilt around killed my arms and shoulders. Personally, I want to make my own quilts from picking the fabric to hand stitching the binding and all the in-between. And I completely agree. You know, it's really interesting. My, my perspective on long arms has changed radically in the last five years and I would say the first step for me was giving myself permission to like uh, machine embroidery, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but I, I watched a class with Eileen Roche and she talked about embroiderers as being, you know, a certain type of person and they like a quick project and they like to have good results and they like to get it done fast and, uh, and they, uh, they like making lots of things. And I thought about it, I was like, well, that kind of describes me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I finally gave myself permission to like and enjoy and start learning about machine embroidery. And then, you know, from there, it was kind of like, oh, well, if I'm allowed to like that, then I'm allowed to like everything. Uh, and when I started looking at the style of quilts that I wanted to make, I wanted to quilt more open. I wanted to be able to finish a baby quilt in 45 minutes. I wanted to be able to make something that was soft and squishy and cuddly and not quilted to death. There were a few years there that I look back at my journals and even a lot of blog posts, and I look back at post after post post after post, I'm saying things like, I'm so bored. <laughs> I'm so annoyed with this quilt. I'm so frustrated. And I wasn't putting two and two together. I was still quilting in a super dense style that was making, you know, just taking forever to finish anything. Um, and then feeling so frustrated when, you know, I quilt all day and like cover a four inch area. So it's one of those things, I think, tapping into that and giving yourself full permission to be interested in anything you wanna be interested in. 
and then finding creative ways to afford it. You know, I, I think that's a key too. Uh, and it can be, I, I think T also mentioned that what she did to, to fit it into her house was she got rid of a couch. Uh, in her formal living room, and that's how she was able to fit it into her house and make it work. And I think that's wonderful. You gotta, have, you know, just have to use creativity and imagination to see things in a different light. I'm always telling people, look at your, you know, guest bedroom that you might not use all the time. Formal dining rooms are great studio spaces. I wish that I had a formal dining room because you better believe it would be my studio and probably have a lot better lighting. You know, that usually formal dining rooms have lots of nice windows, not lots of nice lighting, and they make absolutely perfect places to set up a sewing machine and be able to enjoy yourself. They really do. Far more than dinner parties, I gotta say. That's just my opinion though. So that's it for this week. I hope that you enjoyed seeing all the beautiful things I've been working on. It has been such an adventure and I'm feeling this rush of finishing energy. I'm gonna finish the sweater and I'm gonna start a whole new batch of fun projects. I can't wait, but please don't forget Come and pick up a pre-order copy of Mally the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt and come on an amazing quilting journey with me. The books, I will be signing them. You get a little discount and uh, we're shipping them out on November 1st. So I hope that you'll come and check it out at mallythemaker.com. And now here is the podcast interview with Emily King, all about photography and quilting and living a joyful, creative life. Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and I am here with Emily King. Welcome to the show, Emily. Hey. So Emily is a mom of two who loves photography, running her essential oil shop on Etsy, and now quilting. She was thrown into the world of quilting by accident and hasn't looked back since. So let's start there. What is the accident that got you into quilting? Um, well, this happened in March of this year. Um, my grandmother passed away, and she was a huge, I mean, she just was sewing for many years. She made us all the grandkids' clothes and blankets and quilts galore, everything. Um, but when she passed, the family was kind of stuck with, what do we do with her things? And she had, um, I mean, it was ungodly amount of fabric. <laughs> um, a lot of it was just kind of out of date like polyester and you know just or just bland colors but no one had the room for it and honestly no one else in the family really sewed at all except for my older sister which my grandmother was helping her learn how to quilt and she would help my grandmother here and there um but she had her sewing machine like an old uh singer 500a so slantomatic i <laughs> <laughs> it kind of spills into a desk. So yes. it's huge and it's heavy and no one really wanted to take it because they didn't know what to do with it. So I didn't know what to do with it either. But I said, you know, hey, I'll take it. I'll take all her fabric. Just give it all to me. Yeah. So she had all of her things and the little drawers, all of her notions, everything. So they packed it all up and I took it home and I have it sitting in my dining room. And I just stared at it for a few days, not knowing what to do with it. And I was like, man, I don't know how to use a sewing machine. And I remember her trying to teach me when I was a child, but I was a child. I just wanted to be outside playing with my Barbies. You know, I didn't want to be inside learning how to sew. So anyway, I just jumped on YouTube and that's when I found you and a lot of other people. And I was like, you know, this isn't so hard. So yeah. the first thing I made was a pillowcase. And then it just kind of went from there. But I noticed that the more I practiced every day, my skills just, I mean, they just improved drastically. Like every day, just working on it, they just improved. And I was doing this and then doing that. And I was like, this isn't so hard after all. Yeah. So um, it's something trying to learn how to use her machine. I had to find YouTube videos because I couldn't find the manual that she had. And it was just difficult. It's difficult to use because the, there's no set speed. It's how you move your foot on the pedal. And so I would be sewing and it just shoots up from underneath me. And it just bunches up my thread and just everything like that. So it took some time to get used to. And um, 
you know, it's just one of those things where you just have to practice and practice and practice. And, Absolutely. But here I am, so I haven't stopped since. So I just keep going at it. Yeah, and tell me about the projects that you've made so far. Um, let's see. I'm working on six quilts currently. Um, a lot of them are just the tops right now because I hate doing binding. I hate just the little size. I love piecing and the quilting, but getting past that, sandwiching everything together, I hate doing that. But I'm really bad at starting things, multiple things, at one time. I can't just work on one thing at a time. It drives me insane. So I'm working on multiple things. They're scattered everywhere. I mean, just all over the place. But I'm also working on um, just like baby items. Mm -hmm. You know, like changing pads or like little girl dresses because they're easy and they give me that satisfaction of start to finish. When you know, with a quill, it takes a while. Yes. And I like instant gratification. So that's really kind of what I'm doing now. It's just either the blankets or quilts or just like little baby, you know, accessory type items. Yeah, yeah. I saw the baby booties and they were super cute. And I had to wonder, you've got two boys already. Uh, and you're about my age or so, and so the question is still open. Are you planning on having more kids, or is that door closed completely? I am closed for business. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm done. It's just, but that's the funny thing about doing this is I find myself gravitating towards girl things because I don't have a daughter, but it's fun because yeah. I feel like... I don't know why, but I feel like when it comes to sewing things or quilting, the more, uh, I don't want to say female, but the more girly type fabrics are so appealing to me because I just think they're beautiful. And I gravitate more towards that than I do boy things, which I am trying to work on. But no, there's, mm -mm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with children. That's it for me. I just want to Move on. I love my kids, but that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just one of those funny things. I um I have an eleven year old. James is eleven, and that door has been shut firmly for eleven years. And it's only been like the last two weeks that Josh said something along the lines of kind of hint, like not really a hint. It was just kind of like a hey, you know, I wouldn't mind. And I was all of a sudden like, what? The door's open again? <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm ready to open that door yet. So <laughs> we're just having that conversation. But I know what you mean. Um, having yeah. boys and having that sweetness, you know, of making something with ruffles. I'm kind of getting that out um, by making dolls and playing around with yeah. Mrs. Bunny doll and, and Miss Bunny dresses and that kind of thing. So I totally know where you're talking about. And being able to enjoy the color pink. Hey, you know, sometimes we just don't get the chance to do that when we're the moms of boys, right? Um, I make um, doll quilts for my niece. So she really, that's how I get my fix on that, is just making little doll quilts. So, Perfect. Yeah. That's excellent. Uh, so what has been the biggest surprise getting into quilting? You know, uh, I remember when I got into it, I was confused about what quilting actually was. I thought it was patchwork. And then all of a sudden I realized that the word quilting actually meant something totally different. So yeah. did you run across anything like that? Um. I think for me, honestly, the biggest surprise is how tedious it is and how time consuming it is. I had no idea that people iron fabric, you know, in preparation for quilting or starching. I had no idea. And just the cutting and the starching and the ironing and washing your fabric before you use it, that kind of thing. I was like, gosh, like all the work you have to do to prepare, you know, to make a quilt that's not going to shrink, you know, if you give it to someone, I just had no idea. So I have all the respect in the world for anyone who's been doing this a long time, because now I see, you know, how long it took my grandmother to do stuff. And she, you know, did some machine quilting, but a lot of her stuff was by hand. Like she would probably piece together through machine, but the quilting aspect was a lot of hand stitching and her lines were immaculate. Like just hand stitching was so beautiful. And I just see the time it takes to piece a quilt together. You know, it's just, that was the biggest surprise for me was that right there. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It is a big time investment. Uh, and you know, it's, it's one of those things that 
I think is easy to forget, you know, like I don't even really think about it when I'm, I'm start setting down to cut something up or, uh, you know, prep up some fabric. I could have my hands in that quilt for the next six months. I don't even think about that. But, um, you know, you've done other crafts. You've been into other things. Uh, what are some other things that you do and the time that it takes to, like, let's say photography, shoot a photo, edit it is very different, right? Oh, yeah. Um, that can be very time-consuming. Um, people may not think so, but when I got into that, um, that was, gosh, I've always been into the arts, I guess you can say. Um, but photography, I've always loved. And I started getting into the editing of photography, which is, you know, I don't think people realize that when you take a photo, if you look at a professional photographer's photo, the time it takes to adjust the lighting, adjust the greens, adjust the reds, you know, things like that. I mean, that takes time. I've spent maybe, for me, which may not be a long time for professionals, but for me, I've spent maybe 30, 45 minutes editing a photo just to adjust, you know, the highlights and the shadows and things like that. It's, it's work and it's time consuming and things like that. So, yeah. yeah. But you don't spend six months on a photo, that right? No, I like that instant gratification, I guess. <laughs> like I said, I like to just work on it. And I mean, and honestly, I'm not a professional, so, you know, I wouldn't know what else to do. And I'm not a person that, um, I don't know, I'm not that nitpicky about my photography. I mean, I know what I want and I work at it for a few minutes and then I just move on. So mm -hmm. yeah, and, and that's how we connected via Instagram, your beautiful photos on Instagram. I hope everyone will come and check out Emily. It's Emily M. King photos on Instagram. And how long have you been doing that? Because honestly, your photos are absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, I got into photography about this time last year. I know what you mean about the editing because it is it is yeah. huge. That can take just as much time as setting up and shooting and all that nine yards. And now it, it's a lot less pressure, at least for me. I don't feel like I have to shoot that perfect photo. I can then edit and get that perfect photo. Right. And right. I like that. I like that a lot. So how long have you been into photography and, and shooting and sharing? Um, well, I've always loved photography, but in it hardcore, I guess you could say for maybe three years, I would say like really in depth with it for three, maybe four years. I'll just say maybe four years. Um, I really got into it. Um, strong after my youngest was born. Um, it was just during a time where, um, you know, I was coming out of postpartum depression after I had him. And it's just kind of a phase where you lose yourself in motherhood. You just, you're just gone. You know, you're just constantly taking care of kids. You know, that's all you're doing is all your time is spent with taking care of your children. And it just got to the point where I had no hobbies, no interest, nothing, nothing was happening for me. And you just feel kind of lost, you know? Um, so coming out of that hole, I guess you can say, like you've described in the past, um, photography was the first thing that I started working on. And I, you know, joined Instagram, um, started looking up other people, other photographers, or people just doing it for a hobby. And I was so inspired because there are so many different types of photography out there. And I had no idea. Some people just do black and white. Some people do some extreme editing. Um, some people will do more of like um, the digital like kind of Photoshop where you just had this magical sci-fi looking photo from just a regular landscape. I love that. Um, so I just got, you know, inspiration from that and it kind of developed into my type of style of what I like. Um, but it's just, it's just been, I haven't been taking as many photos as I was before because I'm obviously doing the quilting now, but um, I still love doing it. Like I will take a picture when we go out of town, I make sure I have my camera or my phone. The phone does good photos. I can adjust with my phone. Um, I just make sure I have it with me because I'm going to be snapping some photos and working on those later. So, so it's just been, it's 
it's been really fun and I continue to do it and I hope that my skills improve over time and I still look to other people for inspiration and I'll ask someone for advice and my uh, brother-in-law, he, um, he actually gave me one of his older cameras a few years ago and that was super sweet of him and he sat down with me and he helped me just kind of get the basics of like aperture and you know things like that because that was just hard for me to understand how to use the functions on the camera and stuff like that. So you just kind of learn from that point on um, just by practicing and doing. So Yeah, absolutely. And do you, have you had to develop a, a habit or a, a, a daily routine? I mean, you're also a mom. You're also taking care of your family. You're a wife. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to balancing all of this. And this is something that, you know, I've been wanting to talk to other women about because it's something I'm – steadily working on myself on a daily basis, honestly. Uh, how do you balance your creative passions and all the other hats that you wear? Oh, man. I don't know if I've even found the answer for that, honestly, because it's just, you know, with a five-year-old, it's still up and down. You know, like my oldest, he's 15. So that's easy because he's older. But, you know, with my youngest, there is still just... I find, for one thing, I do find that um, early in the morning, I like to get up before the family gets up. I'm not a morning person, but I've just learned that if I want to do something I want to do, that's my time to do it. So I've learned to just love the mornings, accept it the way it is, and just kind of work a little bit when it's quiet, have my coffee, eat my breakfast without having to get up 15 times, and just quilt or just you know work on photos anything like that I just do it in the morning more than any other time of the day usually every once in a while I might do it at night after my youngest goes to bed but usually I'm just deadbeat tired and I'm just ready to go to bed myself so usually the morning is kind of when I can squeeze in and I still do it throughout the day depending on what's going on so. Yeah. yeah, I'm the same way. I'm not a morning person, but I will get up at 545 every day so I can get that time into myself. Absolutely. And uh, something I did with my son over the summer, uh, we signed a contract uh, before the summer began where he was he was allowed to get out of his bed and start playing in his room and he could go to the bathroom if he needed to go to the bathroom, but he couldn't get up up until eight o'clock in the morning. And my son is a morning person. He will be up at six if you let him. So yeah, we made we made a little bargaining and that worked out really, really well for us. I had at least from 545 to eight o'clock every morning and that was great. Uh, except the weekends. He was allowed to get up any time in the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have a balance, right? Uh, cool. So um, do, so you don't really necessarily schedule any kind of special time. How do you get your editing in? Because your photo photography is gorgeous, and I love your Instagram photos, but I know how much time that editing is, is taking. Um, do you have any sort of system for that, like get the photos off the camera and then set down to edit all at once? I just... I don't have a workflow that is working for me yet with that. No, with uh, editing, that's a little different than the quilting aspect because the quilting um, is more hands-on. I have to be at a certain area to do that. With my phone, if I sometimes what I'll do is if I take photos with my big camera, um, I will just air put them onto my laptop, airdrop it to my phone because my phone, there are a lot of apps that I use to edit my photos um i do have lightroom on my uh mac which i'll use that as well for you know like just the colors and things like that but more of um different types of effects i will transfer my photos to my phone and then edit from there and i can do that i mean if my son's outside riding his little power wheels around the yard i could just sit there and edit a photo and no i don't ever sit down and edit one after that, oh, that would drive me insane. Yeah. Uh, so I just do one. Like if I want to post something, I just go ahead and edit that photo, and then I'll post it. I just do it whenever, you know, I decide to post something on Instagram. But besides that, I don't normally just sit every day and then just edit, you know. Yeah. I just, 
I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, it's been driving me crazy. And I'm like, how do these people do it? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that lets me know. It's just as as you can. So that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, so is photography something that you're wanting to turn into a business down the road? Or is quilting something you want to turn into a business down the road? Or is this just for fun? Um, photography was just for fun. Although I've had many friends tell me I need to do it professionally but it's one of those things where like a like a podcast you did about um what will people think of me is kind of relates to that is what if they don't think it's good enough or what if you know I may think it's good enough but what if they don't like what if I'm getting criticized so honestly I feel like fear in a way has kind of held me back on that um but no, in reality, I don't know. I guess the answer is fear has honestly held me back from that. Because yeah. I've had someone ask me, hey, can you take uh, photos at my wedding? Can you um, take photos of my family reunion? It's 20 people. Can you rally a bunch of people and take photos? I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, like, I wish I could, but I've never done that before. But then that's just me holding myself back. You know, like I need to just take that step and go forward if I want to make, you know, photography and more of a bigger thing. But I don't know. I think right now photography is just for fun. Yeah. But I do want quilting to be more of a business type mm -hmm. aspect. Um, I did open up a Etsy shop for that. But, I mean, it's just maybe four little things in there. So I'm not even considering that to be like a big thing right now. I want to add more to it and build up my skill level, you know, for mm -hmm. that. But yeah, quilting I could see become a business because I really enjoy that and it gives my hands and my mind something to do. So I really like that. It's interesting. It's so it's so fascinating. Um, I'm the same way about certain things. Like you know, certain things are definitely in the like fun category. Like this will never be a business. I never want to make a dime off of it. I just want to have fun. And right. then there's other things that are like. You know, as soon as I got into quilting, I knew I was going to turn it into a business somehow. It took me years to figure out the how, but, uh, you know, it was just something about quilting. Uh, and it's a wonderful industry to work in because uh, it's full of so many women entrepreneurs, uh, you yeah. know, women that want to make stuff and sell it. Uh, then that's, you know, that's what quilting is all about, really. And, and that's a really wonderful thing. It's just so fascinating that, you know, you're kind of, you're worried about, perfection on something you've done for three years which you're clearly very skilled at and then not worried so much about quilting which you've just started I just I love it's that crazy. you just pointed that out to me and I didn't realize that I'm yeah like, that is crazy I don't know yeah I don't know why it's like that I don't know why with photography it's just more of um like standing on a cliff do I really want to jump you know, type yeah, thing. yeah, you're afraid of the judgment, you know, and it might have been that you haven't had ever had any sort of judgment from quilting uh, or heard any, you know, kind of ever right. had a negative experience, I should say, you know, and and I don't know with photography. Uh, I, I've certainly been kind of uncomfortable sharing my photos and stuff. And I I did all the photography for a book and, you know, kind of had to deal with a little bit of, oh, my gosh, is this is this as good as someone else? would have done it and you know or is this as good as a publisher would have done it someone professional and uh I had to you know kind of work through that it's it's some muckety muck stuff that you just have to kind of work right. through it uh and ultimately for me it was just like well I, I don't have another option <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes when you're forced to just go that route then you don't have a choice and that's that's good too uh, so, uh, let's see here. What are you using to edit your photos? The, um, the beautiful effects and stuff that you're getting, you said you're using a couple different apps. Yes. Let me look right here. The biggest one is Mextures. It's M-E-X-T-U-R-E-S. -E um, Mextures is amazing because it can just change the total lighting of your photo. I can't explain it, but if you check that out, it is an app only. Um, just try it out. It's that's the one thing that hooked me on it. Um, I do use other apps, uh, but really, Photoshop Express is another app I use. It's just like a 
a lighter version of the big Photoshop. You can get that as an app. I use that for some basic adjustments. If I'm just doing basic adjustments on my phone and not my Mac, um, I'll use that. But really, honestly, those are the two main ones that I use. There are other ones that I have for like a... If you want to, like, insert a robot or something <laughs> crazy drastic like that, I do have that. But, I mean, honestly, you can just go to the App Store and just find a gazillion things out there. And Instagram, honestly, is a good inspiration. That's how I found a lot of things that I use. But, yeah, Mextures and then the Photoshop Express are the two main ones that I use. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, okay, so you also have another Etsy shop for essential oils. Uh, we talked about that a little bit via email. Tell me about that. Is it um, is it an essential oil company? Which is it? And then uh, what's your favorite scent? Um, let's see. My Etsy shop, The Healing Homestead, is what I decided to call it. Um, I started that early this year. Um, I have been using essential oils for, let's see seven years maybe um it's just more of a natural approach to holistic healing i guess you can say aromatherapy things like that um trying to incorporate that more and then get rid of toxic perfume scented things out um but i started that because honestly oils if you buy from like the multi-level marketing companies, which I am a part of Young Living, I love Young Living, um, but they are pricey for a lot of people who just cannot afford it. So I use Young Living and honestly I use some other brands that are not multi-level marketing that are great and I just wanted to create something that was not the replica of something else because legally you can't do that. But I just want to create something that was similar but cheaper that had high quality oils for other people to use without having to pay, you know, a ton of money for it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have so many blends. Um, honestly, I don't have a favorite favorite, just one because I like them all. You know, mm -hmm. they all you know, work really well and I think they smell fabulous because I created it. So, you know, you ought to keep that in mind. I don't want to give somebody somebody something that stinks. <laughs> <laughs> so so you are mixing these yourself that's excellent right. oh yes. that's super super cool so it's just essential oils do you offer any other like um you know soaps or anything like that um no i'm not doing soaps i did think about it but i just i don't want to deal with that because it's a lot of work doing that um with essential oils the only other thing i've added to essential oils is like the essential oil pouches that you can store your oils in um, some of those are sold out, so I need to make more to put back in there. But, um, yeah, I'm not, only thing else I would do is I do have some facial serums, um, for your, like, face care, um, I have that. Um, I do want to add some more things in over time, but, um, it's a matter of sitting down, finding the oils that work for whatever purpose you're making it for, whatever issue you're making it for, um, and then you have to design the labels, have them custom printed off, and that takes about two weeks and things like that. So it takes time. But, yeah, I do want to add in more body products, but I wouldn't say it would be so more of just, like, oil-based products. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, yes. like, um, I love bath salts. Bath salts are, like, my thing. <laughs> so anytime I go and see, like, you know, bath salts, like there, there's a place in Asheville where you can go and they'll actually make, mix it up for you in oh, the Grove Asheville. Arcade. Uh, and you could do like custom scents and stuff in the bath salts. I love that. Uh, and that store is always busy. So clearly a lot of women love smelly stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, cool. So i um, got a few rapid fire questions here at the end. Uh, so you take a lot of photos of North Carolina. Um, we're, we're both living here. Did you grow up here? Yes, I actually live next door to the house that I grew up in. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> so uh, my dad lives next to us. Um, and so this has worked out because when my husband and I were looking for a place to live, he needed something specific because he runs his own uh, recording studio. So he needed a certain type of basement, you know, to be able to build on and, you know, just 
work that around to what kind of business he's doing out of the home. And so we looked and we looked and we found this house and I didn't put two and two together <laughs> knowing that it was the house right here next to the house I grew up. And I said, oh my gosh. And at first I just did not want to do it. I said, no, no, I want to get out of this neighborhood. Because when you think about getting married and moving on, you're thinking about living elsewhere, you know, yeah. not where you grew up. I wanted to see something else. Um, but honestly, it's worked out great because my two older sisters don't, they, one lives in Charlotte and then the other lives up in Virginia, but I'm the closest. So if he needs me as he gets older, I can literally walk through my backyard and there's his house. So yeah, yeah I've lived here all my life. My whole family lives here. Good. And I think, I think that is really excellent. I, you know, honestly, I, I don't think that there's enough emphasis put on that anymore. Um, right. you know, my in-laws are five minutes down the road. My dad is 30 minutes away. And I honestly feel like I would not be as happy if everyone was further away. And I grew up 20 minutes from my grandma. Actually, it was more like 15 minutes from my grandma's house. And I stayed there every Friday night. Uh, and that was a big part of my childhood. So I think it's awesome. Yeah. You know, I really think that that's a, Maybe that might be a, like a North Carolina thing. I don't know. But um, <laughs> there are a lot of North Carolina isms. And <laughs> growing up here, you probably know. Um, so if you can think of any off the top of your head, like, hey, y'all, <laughs> we can manage to turn you all into one word and make it last five syllables. <laughs> oh, gosh. Bless your heart is one that I say all the time, and people make fun of me who aren't from here. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. I say that a lot, or I don't know, but yeah, y'all is a big one. Yeah, everything is Coke. You know, when you order anything, everything is Coke. You know, it's not Pepsi. No one ever orders Pepsi. It's just, hey, you got a Coke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, because I've never had to, like, analyze myself, so I don't know. I, but anything North Carolina language, I guess, words or slang, you know, I'm sure I use them all. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, okay, so is there a favorite book that you recommend? Oh, man. Uh, let's see. Well, this kind of dates back to... For anyone who has really small children, like babies or toddlers, things like that, um, there's an author, Stephanie Wilder Taylor. She's so funny. Um, she has a few books out about parenting during that time, and one is called um, Sippy Cups or Not for Chardonnay. <laughs> and what's another one? That's really the main one, but I love that one. And even though I'm not in that hard time of parenting a small, small child, I love to go back and read that. Um, that's just that's just such a funny, funny, funny book. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing I like to read. You know, just something funny. Or uh, Anne of Green Gables. I yeah. love that whole series. Uh, I just love that show. I have the DVDs, all of that. So, um, I mean... I don't know, my range of books interest is just vast, you know, I have so many different kinds I like. But. Yeah, absolutely. So what's your favorite type of fabric so far? Uh, flannel. <laughs> flannel is my favorite. Flannel or any type of um, really dense quilting, like quilting cotton. Like mm -hmm. the really dense, soft kind. Those are my favorite. But yeah, flannel right now, knowing that the weather's getting colder, flannel is definitely something that I'm just drawn to. Because it, if you have it on a quilt, it instantly warms you up. Yes. Like there is no trying to warm up the fabric with your body heat, and then you get warm. Like with sometimes with cotton, that can be the case. But flannel is my favorite, favorite, favorite to work with. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. just wait. Try minky because... Oh, uh -huh. Minky. You like minky? Girl, stuff shit. Like <laughs> yes, <cat>. yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, you got to have your vacuum cleaner right there handy. But oh my gosh, I'm in love with minky. Even now, I've been playing with it for over a year, and I can't get enough. Um, this is interesting. If you were given unlimited resources and time, what would you do all day tomorrow? Like you could do anything. What would you do all day tomorrow? Lord. Quilt. Just quilt. <laughs> uh yeah, seriously, just quilt. Like, that's one thing that I wish I could just have unlimited 
amounts of materials just to pick and choose from and just sit down and just sew because, you know, that's just, for me, that's just not realistic to sew all day long, you know, not with the family and that's not my profession. So I have other things I need to do, but yeah, that would be the one thing that I would love to do all day long with unlimited amounts of resources. Absolutely. And last question, what are you most looking forward to in the next five years? Huh. Let's see. Probably seeing where this quilting takes me. You know, I want to see, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, five years from now, my skill is up there to where I feel like I can ease into like the free motion quilting more like I'm still I played with it a little bit but I'm still intimidated by it so I haven't touched it I just see you do it and then I just kind of like oh man I wish I could do that but I'm not practicing well you know that fabric and thread doesn't bite right it's not like gonna set up and yell at you or scream or something like that it's just just do it just do it The worst that will happen is you'll waste a 10 inch square of fabric and a 10 inch square of batting and a little bit of thread. That's it, you know, but it it, it is really one of those things. You just got to bite the bullet and make yourself go do it. No, I don't know what's holding me back. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Emily. It has been a delight. Uh, Please, everyone, come and check out Emily's beautiful photos on Instagram. You can find them at Emily M. King Photos. And tell everybody where your Etsy shops are. Um, My, uh, the Healing Homestead is on Etsy. Um, And the quilting shop, I mean, that's called Emily's uh, Quilting Corner. So those are both on Etsy. Um, So just go there and find me. And if you can't seem to find me on the Healing Homestead, I think you have to... um, that's all lowercase in one word. When you, Etsy's kind of weird about that, about store names. So I think the Healing Homestead is one whole word. So just type that in the search bar. But um, yeah, that's where I am. Excellent. Yeah, making little things. And I'm <laughs> so. sure both are going to continue to grow. Thank you again for being on the show. It was wonderful. Thank you.